1998 Godzilla wasn't that bad. Released originally in 1998, the American Godzilla that I'm referring to isn't the one tied to War of the Monsters or King of the Monsters. Uh, War of the Monsters is a video game. But it's not that one. This is an entirely unrelated one in which Roland Emmerich decided he was going to do his own thing because he didn't like the Godzilla movies. And that seems like a dumb decision to give a director who doesn't have any idea what the people want out of a Godzilla movie the rights to Godzilla. And in terms of watching it as a Godzilla movie, you would be right. However, growing up, I had no concept for a Godzilla movie. Um, I had never seen a Godzilla movie, at least not a good one. I think I remember seeing Godzilla dropkick something at one point, and like Godzilla Jr. in something. The point is, I had, didn't have any idea for what Godzilla was supposed to be. And going into it completely blind, I love- I- I- the, the, I loved the movie. Like, it, it is one of those movies that I go back to to feel like warm fuzzies of nostalgia. And something that I wasn't aware of before I really went into this is that the 1998 Godzilla movie was actually successful enough in order for it to potentially have a sequel. Like, it- it was a box office success in essentially every regard. Like, it made its money back. It's just- the crew wasn't, like, too happy about it. Like, the cast were just like, eh, well, fucking whatever, dude. You know, it, it had its, its ups and downs, but it was still good. It actually even had an animated TV show for, like, two seasons after the movie aired. So there has to be something to it, and I feel like I might as well go ahead and talk about it since I feel so strongly about this. And I really hope that this will kind of compel you to do the same. Like, look at it, remember it, and try to look at it through a different lens. God, I'm burpy today. But before we really dive into it, just, you know, do the YouTube thing. Like it, comment, subscribe, all of that. Just because... <sighs> I, I just... You know, because I'm, I'm sad. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. I don't have a reason why you should. I'm going to try to upload regularly, but if you don't want to, whatever. I understand. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, like, beg you. Anyway, now the very first thing that we really get a look of in this movie is this scene. So in this scene, it really shows how Godzilla was made, and the, you know, birth of Godzilla is always something that is consistent within the, the mythos, which is that nuclear radiation irradiated an already existing organism and then created it. Um, Godzilla himself, at least, you know, classic Godzilla, is just a physical personification, not personification, but a physical manifestation of basically the atomic bombs and the damage that they created, not just with their destructive force, but their radiation. Here we see iguanas being irradiated by the French, as we learn later. This is in French Polynesia. And, you know, of course, with any monster movie, you really have to suspend your disbelief as to where these monsters have been hiding and, like, how they came to be. And based from, like, now until then, it's only been, like... God, maybe 50 years, so it's kind of ridiculous, especially because they are attempting to go for a much more grounded look at the movie, or at the monster, but it just doesn't work like that, but whatever. Anyway, now we get probably one of the best opening scenes for <clears throat> any monster movie that I can remember. Now, see, okay. I love that scene because it sets up what Godzilla is in this movie and for the rest of this movie we're going to call it what um I forget Toho I believe Toho Togo Tojo uh I believe it's Toho who owns the right to Godzilla and they refer to this American Godzilla as Zilla so we're just going to call her Zilla now it's call it Zilla them Zilla whatever but this sets the stage for what this Zilla is it is an animal it is not particularly intelligent in terms of, like, strong intelligence. It is not particularly bent on just destruction. It's just doing its thing, and if you get in its way, it will fuck you up. But that may not be necessarily what its intention is. These fishermen in this scene just had the unfortunate, you know, audacity to be fishing in its waters at this time, and they end up suffering the price. And we really get, like more on this a little later, but this is something that I also really like, which is that it doesn't show Godzilla. It doesn't show Zilla in this scene. It shows parts of Zilla to really give you context for how big that Zilla is, but it doesn't show Zilla. And I like that trend a lot because it doesn't overdo it in this movie. 
And also, something that I've noticed re-watching this movie is actually that a lot of the, the effects really hold up. Um, most movies from this era really just used CGI. I mean, they ham-fisted CGI into everything, everything they possibly could, you know? In this movie, there's a lot of miniatures. There's a lot of things that are actually getting blown up, thrown around, used as, like, real physical objects. And it makes it hold up a lot better than I expected it to. I expected it to just be kind of one CGI gore fest, but it wasn't. It's It's been... It was decent, really, like, to, to look at, to feast on the eyes. Of course, there's some sloppy green screen here and there, and the CGI on the monster can be a little shaky at times, but it's really not bad. Then immediately after that scene, we're given an introduction to our main character, played by Matthew Broderick, Dr. Nick Totopoulos. Three things immediately present themselves. One, it's raining. And I say that like, oh yeah, duh, it's raining. No, I mean, this movie, <laughs> there is not a single time from this point going forward, other than maybe when they're in, pa no, when they're in Panama is the only other time in this entire movie where it is not raining. And I don't mean like drizzling. I don't mean that it's sprinkling. I don't mean like it's draining. I mean like there's a mon there's a monsoon or something because it is torrential downpours. It's 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 hilarious just watching this movie again because it is everyone is soaked all the time. And I oh I I don't know why. I don't know if it was just a a, a side effect of when they were filming or what. But there's just a lot of rain. And you just tune it out after a little while because it's it's ridiculous. Two, people are mispronouncing Nick's name the entire movie. It's just, it's a very 90s kind of joke. Like, they're just going, oh, Mr. Tatapa? And he's just like, it's Tatopoulos. Dr. Nico Tatopoulos, it's Tatopoulos. And they're just like, yeah, whatever, come on. It's so nice. It's 90s. It's corny. It's cheesy. I kind of like it, but that's just because I, I like 90s stuff. And it just, it fills, it fills that hole in my chest, you know? And three, Nick is a doctor. He is studying radiation and the effects that the Chernobyl incident had on the Chernobyl earthworm, which has caused that earthworm to grow exponentially over the years. Now, they're trying to use that as an excuse for how Zilla got so big so quickly and trying to ground that in reality. Ignore it. It never comes, it, like, it's, it doesn't matter. It's a monster movie. Don't, don't try to rationalize it and you'll have a lot more fun. As soon as you say, hey look, this earthworm which breeds and mutates quicker than an iguana got 22% bigger over however many years, but the iguanas turned into skyscraper-sized dinosaur monsters, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not buying it, dude. Like, <laughs> I, I don't care how much more radiation, if there was more radiation, the iguanas would have died. It's, uh, that's just me, though. I mean, it's, it's just me. Anyway, the military comes and they abscond Dr. Totopoulos over to wherever they need to take him to. And then we get our nice little Gojira moment whenever a French guy talks to a Japanese guy in English with a lighter. I, I don't I don't know why I don't know why this works but it does apparently so what did you see old man Gojira. so we get a scene of dr. tennis balls it's in Panama and Panama is where the monster crossed from the Pacific Ocean into the Atlantic Ocean and we'll get to some complaints I have about this a little later but the point is, is they are given context for how big the monster is now by putting Dr. Tatopoulos within the footprint. And we already know how big it is, but seeing something compared to a ship and something's foot compared to a person really gives you a good perspective for it. And then you see the aftermath of the original Japanese ship that we saw at the beginning of the movie. And it's just, it's, it's very cool. It's very well done. They clearly went out of their way for the set design because... It holds up. It shows great destruction from this beast, and it really shows just how little it really gave a, a damn about the actual ship, because it's just beached on, on the beach. It's just sitting there. The ship was never the goal. ship is still intact, like it's still in relatively one piece, but it's thrown to the side because that wasn't 
what it was after. And here we meet Philippe Roche, who is played by Jean Reno. Um, and in this movie, he is playing French Secret Service, but right now he's posing as an insurance agent. And I have a lot of problems with this. Um, this is the, the number two issue that I actually do have with the movie. Um, number one coming later. But... I'll also get to this in a little bit, but needless to say, it doesn't make any sense for him to be posing as an insurance agent here, given the context of the situation, but moving on. Also, there's a there's a real, like, subtle, that's not, not subtle, but it's a real simple transition I like here, where it's just, it shows the footprints fading into New York, and that right there is literally just them going, hey, the monster's on the way to New York. Check this transition out, dude. Look out. And then we're introduced to our next set of main characters. We have Audrey, Lucy, and Animal. His, his name is Victor, but we're going to call him Animal. Audrey, played by Maria Patillo, is my least favorite character in the entire movie. She is a reporter's assistant, I suppose, in New York under a an individual by the name of Mr. Cayman, who is a sexist jerk. Why don't we talk about it over dinner tonight? Your place. Mr. Cayman, you're married. Yes, and you're very beautiful. Have I ever told you that before? Mr. Cayman. And she is a woman in a man's world trying to come up. That story, we've seen it a thousand times. And it's a good one if you, you write your characters well. Audrey doesn't come off as well. Once again, I know I've said this like three times already. But we'll get back to it because it comes to a head in a little bit. Anyway, this happens. What the hell is that dope man doing? So, this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, because just a few days ago, arguably, because we, we're not really given a time frame, um, but just a few days ago, the ship on the Jap- the, the Japanese ship attack happened, and somehow, Zilla got from the South Pacific to New York, point A to point B. Which is roughly five to six thousand miles of land, or not land, of water, the opposite of land, to cover. Um, and it did that in just a few days. I, I disagree, because this, this monster, this creature, this beast, would have been distracted by hunting, would have had to sleep, would have had to rest. It wouldn't be there. Once again, nitpicking, suspend disbelief, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, even with the size of the monster in question. Zilla would have to move a thousand miles every day. And iguanas are land animals, like, that is their primary habitat, so they're designed to, to swim well, but swimming's just a thing they can do, not the thing they were designed for. They were designed for fucking scurrying and getting from, from point A to point B on the ground. But then Zilla arrives in New York, and all of my complaints are forgotten, because honestly, this is my favorite scene in the movie. And then Godzilla just like walking around the city, enjoying the sights. And I do mean enjoying the sights. I mean, it, Godzilla is, or Zilla is not attacking anyone intentionally, not doing anything on purpose. Everything is just accidental damage at this point. And they, it just leaves. Like, it, they just lose the Zilla. They, it's just, they're just like, oh, well, we don't know where it went. And everyone's just like, excuse Excuse me? But just watching the monster walk around the city, the size of the buildings, destroying things without even trying to, not actually paying attention, just like a lost animal on a monster scale, really drives home the fact that this is an animal, you know? Whereas classic Godzilla is a much more intelligent force to be reckoned with, much more self-aware, this one is clearly just an animal. It's a smart animal, much smarter than an iguana should be, but it is an animal, and it is just going around the city trying to figure out a safe spot because it didn't mean to be here. Now, it is a little silly that they lose an 80-foot-tall dinosaur in the middle of New York, but I want to, to turn away from how silly that is and turn instead to the actor playing O'Neill, and actually just O'Neill as a character. So the actor's name is Doug Savant, 
And Doug Savan is playing Sergeant O'Neill. O'Neill is a character that I particularly like because he doesn't come off as a traditional military character. He's not like the colonel who's just being an asshole and yelling at people the entire movie. But also, he has a stutter. And I don't mean like he he has just like a did 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 no he just stutters in his speech like I do I do the same very similarly. We lost sight of it, sir. You want to run that by me again? Uh, after its initial at attack, he uh disappeared. But the thing that I like the most about that is within the script of this movie whether it was because Doug Savant did this out of just creative liberty or whatever the case was, but there's no dialogue mocking the stutter. Nobody at any point in this entire movie goes, <laughs> hurry up, they don't do anything like that. They very much just accept that O'Neill has it and move on. And in the 90s, that's impressive. Like, this is a film from 1998, and there's not a single joke at O'Neill's expense. Impressive. Flawless. Wonderful. That'd be like... If Mayor Ebert, and the mayor and the mayor's aide are based off of Siskel and Ebert because Emmerich didn't like him. But Mayor Ebert is fat. And he's eating candy. A lot. That's the entire joke of that character. It's really stupid, admittedly. But that's the kind of shit the 90s was about. So now we get to Audrey and her character arc. Because Audrey dated Nick in college. Sometime in the last 12 hours. It is not known yet whether or not there it's are Nick. And she sees him on TV. She sees him siding with, or like working with the military to defeat this beast or to understand it or whatever. And she sees him and she doesn't go, oh, wow, good for him. She goes, okay, I'm going to steal Mr. Kamen's press badge, despite not being a reporter. Use it to illegally sneak in to the military compound, which is a federal crime. Um, I'm going to meet with Nick, find out that the monster is pregnant, steal top secret information, air it on live television, get him discredited because of it so they don't believe that the monster is pregnant, and then only be upset because it backfired and Mr. Kamen took credit for the report. That's our main girl. That's our main female lead. That's the love interest. She does all of that and we're still expected to like her? No, nah, I'm, I'm not having it because... That is some underhanded, lowbrow shit, and I'm not standing for it. At no point in my life have I ever seen an ex of mine and went, I can use them and exploit them for my own personal gain. Especially because at one point in this, in this movie that I'm po definitely pointing at right now, not my script, in this movie, she actually sees evidence that he never got over her while she's in his lab, and she still goes through with it. I, I uh. This is why I hate Audrey. She feels bad later. She does. And you could argue that it was because of the things that Animal and Lucy told her, which was just, you know, nice guys finish last. I've heard that a thousand times in my life. Never once have I pulled some shit like this. I just... I don't... I don't get it. I don't get it. So, moving past a few things, there's a couple of filler chase scenes. Zilla destroys some helicopters. Um, is pregnant, is using the subway system to get around New York, and that's a lot of fish. That's a lot of fish. So now that Nick has been discredited and is, by all accounts, just leaving, the Frenchman from earlier, who's been there kind of on the scenes, he bugged the mayor, and he's been hanging out just doing his thing, watching the events unfold. They somehow manage to wrangle up the exact cab and location that Nick is going to be in, and they get him to their base of operations, where they reveal that this creature was created from the French nuclear testing in the French Polynesian area. And they want to stop the monster just as much as, you know, the U.S. military and just as much as Nick. And they also believe that she's pregnant, or he's pregnant, and that Nick is right. So they're going to help him, and they're going to sneak into Madison Square Garden, which is where the nest is, and they're going to blow up a bunch of dinosaurs. Why don't they just, like, walk up to the U.S. military and go, We think the monster's pregnant, and we want to help you. Because they they say, um, Mr. 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 Monsieur Roche says in the film that they want to keep it quiet. They want to keep it a secret. They don't want the people to know that the French were doing their thing here. Pretty sure everyone's going to know anyway. 
Um, pretty sure everybody's gonna figure out that this was derived from the French testing in the Polynesian. Like, there's no way that they won't because it's pretty easy to track, especially if there's more of them. There might be, there probably are. So what I don't understand is why the French government doesn't just offer its open support to the US, say, hey, this is something that is our fault and our problem. Here's a lot of resources to help. But instead, what they do is they sneak in a significant amount of the French Secret Service with military-grade weaponry, and they go find a way to kill the monster with, like, a machine gun or something, man. I don't know. Figure it out. And admittedly, they do. But they could have just sided with the U.S. military and dropped bombs on stuff, which is what the solution ends up being, really. And also, if the French Secret Service are caught on U.S. mili- like, on U.S. grounds, and they're, they don't just, like, have a reason to be there that anyone's aware of, then they're just gonna, that's an international incident. Like, that's a concern. Don't, don't mistake. I love this movie. There's just, there are problems. It's not perfect. So at this point, Nick sides with the French Secret Service so they can get back into the garden and potentially kill the nest that they think is there. Audrey's currently crying because she's a bitch, and Scooby's back there chilling, thankfully. So Animal comes in, and he offers to make everything better. And also, I want to take a moment to kind of thank the movie for really getting the spirit of a lot of New Yorkers more correct than I think a lot of other movies do. Um, New Yorkers are crass. They say a lot of things that sound a lot less PC than modern era would like, still to this day. And it's not just the accent, of course. It's just the word choice. But they have a good heart. I mean, they're good people. People are inherently good in general, I believe. So they really capture that here, and, and thankfully, like, Animal and Lucy are, like, number one in this. So they're currently on the way to the garden to stop the nest, or to blow up the nest, and the military sets up a second fish pile. This second fish pile is when the... one of the better scenes in the movie happens. Um, Zilla sees the military there. Like, sees them. And recognizes the danger and leaves. So admittedly, it is a little ham-fisted how they kind of go about showing the thinking process. Like it might as well just go into full brain blast territory, you know? But then, I mean, Zilla leaves and the US military misses every single shot that they fire as is tradition in, in movies. Um, but the old reliable Navy is sitting in the bay with a submarine and they kill the shit out of Zilla, like, they just shoot, shoot him dead, like, like, they fuck, like, he goes to heaven, and legitimately, like, as a kid, I thought this was, this was literally Zilla dying and going to heaven, like, ascending into the clouds, and becoming, like, an angel, becoming Godzilla, you know? I know now it's just it floating away from the debris, but, like, come on. You can't, you can't tell me that that doesn't look like it ascending into heaven, right? Anyway, they found the eggs! And there's, there's a lot of eggs. There's a lot of eggs. Stop counting. Um, they didn't bring in the C4 for the eggs. And, you know, turns out, as is the case all the time in movies, um, as they get there, the eggs hatch. Fuck. The worst possible outcome. Who would have thunk that this would have been whenever it happened? So the eggs hatch, and all of the people smell like fish because of what they've been doing, who they've been hanging out with, where they've been going. So the little monster dudes um, start killing them. And I also like these little like monsters because most of them are little like puppets or CG, especially when they're popping out of the egg. And that makes them look a little better, I guess, than they would be if they were just pure CG. Also, I just want to point out that for being a member of the French Secret Service, this motherfucker right here sure was not willing to fucking die for his country. Because he's sitting here arming the C4. He is ready to go. He is ready to press the fucking boom button. Then he sees that one of the, one of the dinosaurs up there, one of the Zillas, is like, you smell, you smell like fish. And he's just like, oh, fuck, do I? And instead of just pressing the button and killing a large majority of them... Which, maybe, also would have killed his friends. I'm not gonna say, like, he's completely wrong in that, but, like, instead of potentially wiping them out, he just sniffs his hand, and then dies. That's it. That's his character arc, is he sniffs his hand and he dies. 
so at this point they're they're all running around and they're getting away from the monsters and only the good guys like the protagonists are alive right now we have mr roche we have audrey we have animal and we have nick only survivors so they have the idea to use the broadcast booth at madison square garden in order to get the report out and they do they successfully manage to get it out on live tv by contacting some dude named ed and Ed puts them on the TV. So, everyone's aware of it now. Now the military is sending bombs to blow the fuck out of the garden. I don't like this scene because they have to dress Audrey up like an actual, like, reporter lady. Like, she's got to be all official. She's got to go through the motions of just, like... Like, hello, Dr. Tennis Balls. Can you tell us about these eggs? Well, yes. See, there are a lot of eggs. Oh, well, tell us, tell us about the eggs. They, they should have just gone... <laughs> Okay, guys, get here, get here, get here. There's eggs. There's like 200 fucking eggs. They're gonna kill all of us. They're gonna do it. They're gonna end our lives. Just blow them the fuck up. But they didn't. They, they had to be professional for some reason. So, of course, you know, the main characters have to live. So they get out with just enough time to spare. The garden blows up. All the babies are dead. End of the movie. Except it's not. Um, so this is arguably the most unnecessary part of the entire film. But it's one that kind of lends itself to a lot of theories. Um, at least in my mind. So at this point, Zilla rises out from underneath the garden and goes, uh, who killed my babies? Uh, who you are? And so it begins chasing them. Something that I thought about while watching this, this go round. This Zilla seems smaller than the one that was previously killed. Um, and not just by like a little bit, but by like a significant margin. This Zilla is able to like hunker down under the buildings, whereas the other one was towering above most of them. And this one is like, its eye is probably the size of a man instead of being gargantuan compared to one like the one in the tunnels. Admittedly, a lot of this can be due to perspective or due to other things of that nature. But we don't understand these creatures, and Nick Totopoulos is assuming that they can pre reproduce asexually, but we're never given evidence to support that theory. He's assuming a lot, actually. So who's to say there's not two of them? Who's to say there's not a male and a female? And they came here and made a nest. And this is either the male or the female, probably the female since it's returning to the nest, and you killed the male. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought back to like size differences, and that would make sense for the female hunting and scavenging, and the male just being kind of around seeing the sights. One is like actively hunting, the other is just hanging out protecting the nest, and it's why it's more likely to attack and things like that. It makes sense to me, and I like the theory a lot because otherwise the other working theory is what the movie presents, uh, like, obviously, which is that it just survived the torpedo attack and came back. That's dumb. I don't like that. I like my version. So I'm gonna believe my version. Especially because it's proven, you know, that one egg, based on the animated series, can grow to full size within a few weeks. So it stands to reason that it's possible, even, that it had a litter before and only one of them lived, and it just grew up and they made babies together. Like, it's gross. It's dog it's 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 gross it's lizard incest but i mean that's that's nature baby but just just go back and it like after this if you want to rewatch the movie keep that theory in mind please because I, I i it really makes it make a lot more sense to me and there's a lot of weird size differentials that typically are just chalked up to monster movie bullshit but just have that theory in mind when you're seeing it okay but the day is saved thanks to the powerpuff girls philippe roche and the u.s military <laughs> And honestly, it was a good movie. Like, is, is it perfect? <laughs> even just for like a generic monster movie? No, no, not, not even remotely close. There's a lot of problems with characters. There's a lot of weird inconsistencies with like the way things are. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense sometimes. And overall, CGI can be a little wonky. That all being said, is it as bad as everyone made it out to be or has made it out to be since? No! <laughs> 
it's a pretty decent movie. It's one that I have a soft spot for because I have nostalgia for it, but on its own, it's still a good movie. It's another monster movie, but it really focuses more on, like, the animalistic nature of what these monsters most likely would be, how they would come to pass, blah, 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 blah. And as a matter of fact, Matthew Broderick has actually gone on record saying he still likes this movie, and he feels like the worst thing about it is that he feels he was miscast. I don't know if he was or not, but movie seems good, and I agree with him, really. Like, if that's the one, if, that, if, the, if there was a, a, a concept, like, if I had to nitpick a few things, I could. But it's a good movie. It's not a Godzilla movie. It's not. Nothing will ever make this a Godzilla movie. That being said... Um, just go into it with a different title in mind. Um, you could, you know, pick something like Iguana Domination, um, Annul What You Did Last Summer, or if you think radioactive lizards are crazy, Imagine Dragons. If, if anybody's still watching, thank you for watching all the way to the end. Um, just to kind of give background for what the channel is going to be, most likely. I'm probably just going to do whatever I feel like in regards to like entertainment media. Talk about it from my perspective. Try to be positive, mostly. I don't care for negativity. It's not worth the effort. And just, I just kind of want to talk about things. So if that's your thing, just make sure you comment, subscribe, whatever you need to do. Ring the fucking bell, I guess, sure, if you want to. I don't ring bells, honestly. So if you don't want to, I also understand, but hey. 